Ladies and gentlemen, in the entrepreneurial fashion, we're going to reorganize a little bit. We are not going to take a coffee break after Fadi, but you can have coffee during Fadi's speech and then during Tony Alumalu's speech. Tony Alumalu, who's the speaker after, is, if you will, the Fadi Randor of Africa. He's flown in just for this uh, session, so we are starting a little bit late. So please uh, move in and out. So we will go from now, I will have the great pleasure of introducing one of my heroes, Fadi Randor, and then to Tony Alumalu, uh, one of the great leaders of Africa. So first, let me tell you the little bit that everybody knows about Fadi, and then I'm gonna tell you my very personal experience with Fadi. Uh, because leadership happens uh, at the most unexpected moments and often in the truly unexpected way. So you all know Fadi did something the world thought was totally impossible, the first publicly listed Arab company on NASDAQ. When Arabs weren't known to be, you know, rock star entrepreneurs, he broke, not the glass ceiling, he blow, broke the steel ceiling on this. And uh, this is one of the few people in the world, or certainly in our region, you could just say Fatty, it's one of the first person we're all on first name basis with. You say Fatty, most likely you know who we're talking about. That's quite an achievement. He is the fatty of our entire region. And he stands and brings that shining light to uh, everywhere. And let me tell you what that has done for All World and the Arabia 500. We went and we decided we want to find 500 next fatties called the Arabia 500. And people said to us, oh, call it the Arabia 50. You know, Arabia 500 is really not right. And I said, no, 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 if there isn't an Arabia 500 out there, there will be. Count on us, mark our words. I can't tell you how many people laughed at us and said, you are really, you know, going way beyond here. And it's an Arabia 50. And there were only two people who said, let's do it right now and we're gonna help you. And that was Michael Porter, the Harvard Business School, and Fadi Randor of Aramex. No one else wanted to add that extra zero and make it a 500. And it is in adding the zeros and going way beyond what is possible that I feel that the Arabia 500 was very, very much inspired by him. And in fact, two nights ago, we honored the Arabia 500 here on the stage, and many of them are in the room here today. But you can't start until somebody lets you start. And Fadi has been that inspiration to all of us. And when we started the Arabia 500, we went around all these countries and said, who are your great entrepreneurs? And I can tell you, every single person said Fadi. I said, okay, that's good. That's, we don't have an Arabia 1, we need the Arabia 500. So we would get to an Arabia 3 because they would add Beit and Maktoub, which coincidentally, or not, Fadi had helped. So we were at an Arabia 3 right away. And then we had to make up a lot of ground to get to the 500. So when anybody we spoke to the first name of an entrepreneur for our entire region is on a first name basis, as I said, it's Fadi. Now, um, we went and wrote an article called The High Intensity Entrepreneur, and one of the publishers of the Harvard Business Review who essentially co-wrote the article with us, uh, we talked about a new breed of entrepreneurs in this region, and the one proof point we could give that there was a whole new breed emerging is Fadi. We had to put him in so we wouldn't be laughed out of the Harvard Business Review. He said, well, there is absolutely one that you all know, so let us write this article. And in fact, the editors of the Harvard Business Review were so impressed, they changed the title to the High Intensity Entrepreneur because what they read about this region blew them away. And that was because we were allowed to put down a flag that Fadi existed, there were many others. Fadi did something uh, well beyond even that. His business model was to go where no one had ever gone before. And I mean literally, no one had ever gone before and no one would dare to go. So he remapped the Middle East in terms of delivering things. I live in Riyadh and we don't have street addresses. So often, Aramex says, well, I live three blocks be below or above the Aramex on this street. Your, your address is even Aramex. He delivered to North Africa when people hadn't even really been there. He delivered all across Lebanon in the middle of a civil war. He went where everybody feared to tread and in that he captured a market like nobody could have done other 
than the person we all know on a first name basis, Fatty. And it turns out in the Arabia 500 that the most successful industry is logistics and transportation. The number one company from Kuwait, logistics. Land, sea, and air. The number two company from Pakistan, land, sea, and air. So he knew what he was doing way in the 80s, and we're lucky that we now have uh, many in this room uh, who have had the opportunity to meet Fatty. So from the United States, from Jeff, to the man who started so much of what we stand here about, Fadi Randor. Well, can you hear me? That, and that's, that what you said is crazy, actually. So I, <laughs> it's very embarrassing. But uh, to return the favor to you, I would like all the Arabia 500 people here to stand up and give them an applause, please. Where are they? Yes. Thank you very much. I am so happy and honored to be here with you today. I want to start uh, where, where, uh, where Jeff had left. Uh, you know, when you have great speakers like Jeff speak before you, they basically have said everything I wanted to say. I just want to make it an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor. So what you said, uh, from ideas, I will turn them into, into practice right in my presentation here, if you will allow me, Jeff, because entrepreneurs will always say the same things since we've gone through the same thing practically. Now, before I say that, I also want to uh, continue from where uh, we had a little bit of a debate uh, uh, yesterday in one of the sessions. Uh, one of the greatest entrepreneurs in, in the United States of America is Reid Hoffman. You all know him, LinkedIn. He wrote a fantastic book called The Startup of You, Startup of You, the Individual. And the, in, in the first page, in the first page uh, of the book, he quotes uh, uh, my hero, the greatest entrepreneur I, on earth, I think, Muhammad Yunus, the founder of, of Grameen Bank and the Nobel laureate. So people that say we don't have great entrepreneurs from this part of the world, oh yes, we do. Probably the first entrepreneur on earth to win a Nobel Prize is a Muslim from Bangladesh. So, Muhammad Yunus says, and he quotes him in the, first, in the first part of the book, he says, all human beings are entrepreneurs. All human beings are entrepreneurs. When we were in the caves, we were all self-employed, finding our food, feeding our, uh, ourselves. That's where human history began. As civilization came, we suppressed it. We became lab labor because they stamped us as labor. You are labor. We forgot that we are entrepreneurs. So my talk today is, is about that. And, and Reed continues in his book by saying, you are born an entrepreneur. He says, all humans are entrepreneurs, not because they should start companies but because the will to create is encoded in human DNA, and creation is the essence of entrepreneurship. So I, my talk is about that today. And I want to demystify entrepreneurship just a little bit so that we come down to earth and not think it's, it's an earth-shattering thing and it's something that is out of this world, just like Muhammad Yunus and Reid Hoffman told us earlier. It is, it is very simply in my definition uh, of the word and in many people's definitions, so I'm not saying anything new here. It is, I'm saying it's a state of action. It is about creating new wealth. It is about startups and small, medium and medium enterprises. It's also about entrepreneurship in big companies. It is about creating jobs also. At the core of it, and at the core of it today, as we, have, uh, uh, as we are witnessing the, the financial collapse in the West and, and, and the political collapse uh, uh, or chaos that we are having in, a re in, in our region, whether it's spring, winter, or awakening. And I want to say something that entrepreneurship is learned. It is a skill. It is learned. We are not born with it. Everybody can be an entrepreneur. If he chooses to be an entrepreneur, you learn it. Uh, my friend here, Maher Qaddoura, who is sitting right in front and he 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 spoke yesterday at one of the uh, at one of the panels he came out with an idea just six months ago about literacy and liter uh, financial literacy in schools 
So he decided to create something that's called Shirkitna. Shirkitna in English means our company. So he goes to high schools, public high schools, in partnership with, uh, with, uh, with the education system in Jordan. And he goes and teaches young kids to create companies in their own schools. He created 404 startups in six months. 404 startups with 3,600 participating students and a total profit of about 80,000 JDs, which is about $100,000. So whoever tells you entrepreneurship is not something that is learned, very simple. He has created a curricula that is very simple to learn in school. And these kids have actually created, uh, generated income for themselves. Very powerful. And entrepreneurship, ladies and gentlemen, is not a conference. It's not a policy. And it's not a government initiative. We have to remember that. Yes, we love government. And yes, government is fantastic. And it's an enabler. But that's all that it is. It needs to enable and get out of the way. We don't need their money. And we don't need anything else. We only need them to enable, create the environment, and move out of the way. Because entrepreneurs will do their thing by themselves. The more government, the less entrepreneurship, trust me. You go to any country in the world where government is per pervasive, and you will see less entrepreneurs. I will bet you. If you give me an example, that is otherwise. Uh, and entrepreneurship, as Jeff had said earlier, is, an, on, is a societal process. It is adopted. It is created. It is part and parcel of society. Everyone in society has to be involved in it. It is a stakeholder process. So government, yes, is part of it. I'm not saying no. But it's the rest of us. It's you. It's everyone that wants to create a business. So it, entrepreneurship, most of all, in what I say, is about people, their sense of ownership and empowerment. And it is about activism. What does activism mean? It means you take that idea and put it into action. It's a very simple process. Yesterday, in, my in, in, in a comment I, I, I did with, uh, uh, with my friend Tom Speechley about startups, um, and there was talk that, you know, we are talking too much about startups, and I think we are saying too little about startups. In fact, the Arab world has very few startups as such. So my good friend Lulu Khazin from Nabish, who is a great entrepreneur, he, she's probably here somewhere, dig her out. She tweets something this morning, and I woke up early to fine-tune my talk. Uh, she sent me an article by somebody called Michael Ellsberg. He wrote an article in the New York Times um, uh, back in 2011 titled, Will Dropouts Save America? Will Dropouts Save America? And then he says, uh, I'm quoting him here, he says, uh, uh, President Obama told Congress, everyone here knows that small businesses are where most new jobs begin. But then he says, in a detailed analysis, in a need, detailed analysis by the National Bureau of, of Economic Research, it found that nearly all net job creation in America, nearly all job creation in America comes from startups. Not from small businesses, he says. From startups. And we don't want to confuse small businesses with startups. So, we need more startups in the Arab world. I'm just answering Tom Speechley. Uh, I needed to do that. Uh, and as we talk about startups, we're talking about the most famous story of them all here in the Arab world. Because we also need to know that in the Arab world, being in e-business, being in business on the internet, being in the business of the knowledge economy is also essential. So for those people who keep complaining that we talk about startups in the technology business, in the internet business, well, yes, delivery of services in the future and today is going to be online. Is going to be online and we have to get there. We are at least 10 to 15 years late in the Arab world to provide our businesses online. So let us not, because it's a sexy word, punish people and punish startups because they're starting businesses online. It is the future. They are the pathfinders. We have to support them. 
And Maktoub was the first one of them. They sold to Yahoo, yes, everybody celebrated that. They are fantastic role models, but I need to tell you another story about Maktoub. When they sold to Yahoo, they had 300 employees only. The successor of Yahoo, which is the Jabbar group, which was founded uh, by, which was a continuation uh, of, of Maktoub uh, and continued to be run by Samih Tuqan, uh, the founder of Maktoub and, uh, uh, and Hussam Khouri, they raised an extra hundred million dollars just three years after that. They have Souq.com, which is the largest, one of the largest online uh, retail uh, operations. It's the, the, the uh, Amazon of the region. They have an extra 600 employees and they are creating the online business in the region. Not only that, six entrepreneurs from Yahoo, from uh, uh, Maktoub, after it was sold, leave and create their own startups and have generated hundreds, if not thousands, of new jobs and raised at least $100 million extra. One of them is Marka VIP, which is a leader in, uh, again, competing with Souq.com uh, uh, in, in e-commerce business in the Arab world. I called him last night, the founder. I said, how many employees do you have? He says, in the past year and a half, we have created 370 jobs. So yes, they are creating jobs out there. And if you create one business and it's successful, it will breed tens and tens and tens of new businesses. This is where entrepreneurs, earn, earn their, uh, their stars. This is where they get trained but with entrepreneurial companies and they leave and they start their own businesses. I spoke also, somebody else was since, uh, 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 talking about the real world businesses. Uh, 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 all fala just Falafel yesterday was mentioned as a company that started out of the UAE. It started out of Abu Dhabi. I called, I, I located the founder yesterday. I gave him a call. I told him, tell me your story. He says, my name is Mohammed Bitar. I am Lebanese. I lived in Abu Dhabi. I started Just Falafel in, in 2007 with five shops. He employs 10 people per shop. Five shops employs 10 people per shop. By 2011, he had 25 Falafel stores in Qatar, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Oman, and more in the UAE. 25 times 10, you calculate that. But more importantly, as of today, he has signed 560 franchise agreements worldwide. 200 of them are in London, in the UK, 100 in Turkey, 130 in Egypt, and so on and so forth. Multiply that by 10, and you will see how many jobs this guy has created. It's an incredible story. So, Entrepreneurs do pop up from here. Nobody has heard probably of uh, old falafel unless you ate a falafel uh, uh, sandwich from there. But the guy is a job creator. It's a machine that creates jobs. And so what? You know, a job is a job. At the end of the day, Arab Spring is about dignity. And dignity is, as we are told in the well-being index, about jobs. And the Arab youth continue to tell us in various surveys that fair wage is their priority. High cost of living is their greatest threat and worry. And 26% of them tell us in a Silatec uh, survey, 26% of the Arab youth, believe it or not, say they want to start their own businesses. So let's just throw that myth that the Arabs don't want to start their own businesses. And a good chunk of them are here in the, Arab, in, in the Gulf. So not all Gulfies want to be employed by, by their governments. They also want to have the chance to start their own businesses. And more than 90% 90 of Arab youth from low-income countries, 90% of Arab youth from low-income countries, this is critical, believe that hard work yields results. Hard work yields results. Because we live by the concept of wasta in the Arab world and bakhshish and all sorts of things. But actually, people on the ground are telling us something else. He says, if I work hard, I am going to achieve. So having done this introduction, I'll quickly go through with uh, what, uh, what Jeff had said earlier, but I'll, I'll turn it into action. And I'll say uh, the, Arab, the, the Arab private sector is missing in action. We are missing in action, unfortunately. We are, even though we are best positioned, best positioned to create an entrepreneurial environment in the Arab world. Uh, we uh, either do fragmented uh, initiatives, either uh, each does his own thing, which is fine, but the challenge ahead of us is so daunting. Everybody talks about 100 million jobs, etc. I'm, I'm not going to uh, repeat that for you. My idea here is 
as the private sector thinks it's missing in action or is actually missing in action, the sustainability of its existence today, and all we need to do is look at our friends in Egypt who have been in the business world and how the Arab uh, uh, awakening in Egypt has affected the concept of private enterprise in the Arab world today. The sustainability, the sustainability and success of private enterprise in the Arab world is in the hands is in the hands of the private sector so that it takes out, uh, itself out from deep sleep into action. And how can we do that? There is no one else more, uh, more capable of doing that because we have the skills, we have the capital, we have the companies, we have the jobs, we have the, uh, the entrepreneurial brain, the entrepreneurial brain that solves problems. When we look at societal problems, the entrepreneurs are the solvers of these problems, not necessarily only government. So in 2010, Abraj Capital launched something that was incredible here, and people thought it wasn't going to work. They launched something called celebration of entrepreneurship. And this is probably a successor process. This is why you see Abraj everywhere here, because Abraj were pioneers in doing that. Abraj is a private equity startup that started the private equity business in the Middle East. They decided they wanted to bet on entrepreneurs in the Arab world. They brought in 2,400 entrepreneurs, launched Wanda, launched Thread, and started scaling down in their investments from private equity all the way to small and medium-sized enterprises. Why am I saying this? I am saying this because as we have done that, we went to sleep a little bit, and now we need to wake up again and see how do we continue that process of celebrating entrepreneurship, what I would call Arab private sector 2.0, or much more importantly, much more importantly, let us think of it this way. Since everybody talks about corporate social responsibility, give it a thought. Let us, let us in the private sector talk about corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. Let us demystify it. Let us bring it down to earth. Let us take it all the way down to specific initiatives that is called the entrepreneurial responsibility of the private sector in making it happen. So from there, from, so from, thank you. So from now on, as, as people come to you, you say, you know, you don't say we have corporate social responsibility. You say we are corporate entrepreneurially responsible. What does that mean? Uh, and I am proposing 10 points. I'll go through, the, through them very quickly. Jeff mentioned them. The Deputy Secretary of State uh, talked about them. Most of you, of you know whether, what they are, but let me mention some of them here. In a, in a survey that was done a couple of years ago by, uh, by the Economic Intelligence un, uh, Unit about the private sector, well, I should say, number one, get involved in education. Get involved in education. That's, I'm talking to the private sector here, not to the public sector. Public sector, I'll mention later. Get involved in education. How? The, the, uh, uh, the survey said, when asked how important the private sector will be to public education, public education, over the next decade, 70% of the companies that responded, 70% of the companies that responded say it would be extremely important. This made the private sector the most essential element to that after government, obviously, because government uh, uh, owns, especially in the Arab world, owns the education story, owns private sector companies. Most of them are for profit. And yes, they do teach, but the, the, the masses of the Arab uh, youth are, are taught and educated by, uh, if we can call it that, by the public sector, by the ministries of education. And then, Another report uh, that comes, uh, came out just recently uh, by the World Bank on jobs, on jobs. They say the main focus of education systems continu continues, continues to be the production of future employees, guess where, for the public sector. This is globally, ladies and gentlemen, globally. The main focus of education systems continues to be the production of future employees for public sector. And then we say we want to have entrepreneurship, or we, ha we want to ma match the requirements of the marketplace for the jobs that are being, uh, that are required by, uh, uh, the jobs that are being created by the, by the public education system. And then recently, McKinsey came out with a report on a global basis. I'm sorry I'm throwing statistics at you, but so that I am not, you don't think I'm shooting off, off the top of my head and speaking like entrepreneurs speak from gut. Uh, but this is science. 
This is science. Half of youth, this is uh, uh, December 2012, now, McKinsey report. He says, half of youth are not sure that their post-secondary education, this is global, post-secondary ed education has improved their chances of finding a job. Half don't think that their education has made a difference in their job. Almost 40% of employers say a lack of skill is the main reason for entry-level vacancies. So I have vacancies I can't employ because there's no skill. And then the same Ellsberg that I mentioned earlier wrote a book called The Education of Millionaires. The Education of Millionaires. Why you think and it's not uh, wh what you think and uh, what you think and it's not too late. It's not what you think and it's not too late. He says if startup activity is the true engine of job creation in America, one thing is clear. Our current education system, I talk about America because all, all of us want to send our kids to study in America, okay? So I wanna, if, if we're talking about the best place to get educated, so, and let's trickle down, all the way down uh, to where we think our problems are. He says, our current education system is acting as the brakes. The brakes, yani, stop, stop. Simply put, from kindergarten through undergraduate and graduate school, you learn very few skills or attitudes that would ever help you start a business. Skills like sales, networking, creativity, and comfort with failure. Comfort with failure, ladies and gentlemen, is taught. It is not cultural. We are not born to be worried about failing. We are taught that it's okay to try and fail and try and fail and then stand up on your feet, and it's okay to celebrate people that have failed and showed us the way. I would tell you, I would employ anyone who has started the business today and failed at it because he is going to be a fantastic employee in my organization or the best entrepreneur in, in his second try. So, yes, involvement in our education system in a public-private partnership probably and putting curricula together so that we say what sort of skills we need from the public sector so that they can educate these people, not in a conveyor belt system. Here, everybody reads Arabic, everybody can be a poet, everybody can be nice in his language, and we're always so protective of our language. Arabic, 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 Arabic. Well, yes, Arabic, but English, French, Spanish. Because the world has, is, is, is borderless today. If you don't speak many languages, if you don't speak the technology languages, if you don't speak uh, uh, the IT language, if you, don't use, if you don't have computer skills, you're not going to be employed. You can be uh, the best poet on earth, and I love poets, but they're not going to be employed. They're not going to be entrepreneurs. They're not going to solve the problem of the Arab world, but they're going to tell us about them, and we might throw them in jail sometimes. So, and, and uh, I didn't mean that, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Singapore has a ready-made system for us. If we don't want to create it in-house, who says we have to reinvent the wheel? Let's go to Singapore a little bit, the best education system on earth, and tell them what did you do, and then take it and copy it. It's okay. You know, we buy cars from the West. Why don't we buy education systems? We buy our suits from the West. Why don't we buy education systems? What is so embarrassing about that? Why do we have to reinvent the wheel and create our own education system? Yes, we'll introduce Arabic to it. Yes, we can Arabize it. Yes, we can do all sorts of things with it. But somebody else did it and became very successful. Singapore has 100% unemployment. It is zero employment required. Take it. Shanghai today is the most competitive city on earth when it comes to education. What did we learn from Shanghai? Certainly not Chinese. So, yes, we have to be involved in, in, in that. And there are, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, efforts here. Uh, just like I spoke about uh, uh, my friend Maher Qaddura and his efforts as an individual. Uh, uh, in Jazz Al Arab, we all know about it, and we heard from Sulafa yesterday about the fantastic work that they do in financial literacy and entrepreneurship training in schools in the Arab world. 
We also have case studies. We need to do case studies. Case studies about Arab entrepreneurs in our universities. I don't want to learn about Bill Gates, ladies and gentlemen. He is already famous. We love him. He's fantastic. But I want to read about Maher Qaddura. I want to read about Muhammad Yunus. I want to read about all sorts of other people, that have, about Samih Tuqan, about uh, 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 Ala Salal that created Jamalon. Nobody has heard of him. Why don't we write about him? We want to read about Arif Naqvi also. Why not? AUB, the American University of Beirut, and the American University of Cairo have started an, a case study program where they are documenting startups and, and, and established businesses. It needs to be disseminated across the Arab world. And every time you talk about, about these things to universities, they say, we need money. Do you think the Arab world lacks money, ladies and gentlemen? I don't think so. So, skills transfer. Uh, and why is skill transfer so important? Uh, we're talking about vocational training here. The private sector being involved in vocational training. Why? I just went to, uh, to Pakistan recently. Arif Naqvi invited me to go and, and see his incredible Aman Foundation, a private sector initiative. He put up $100 million to solve two or three problems in his hometown of Karachi. I went and saw them all, but the most important one of them is that he created something called Aman Tech. Amantech is a state-of-the-art vocational training center that has about 5,000 people going in to train on various things, from fixing cars to being carpenters to being welders, etc., etc., etc. But he doesn't only teach them that. He teaches them, he teaches them how to speak English. He teaches them how to eat on regular tables, uh, f uh, uh, what do you call it, um, etiquette. Simple. Did you think that a vocational training person needs etiquette in how to, uh, to conduct himself in a restaurant? And he teaches them cleansiness. Why am I saying that? 5,000 of these people, a lot of them might be entrepreneurs to have up to open micro shops to fix either cars, become their own carpenter shops. And yes, entrepreneurship is not only about Aramex or Priceline.com or uh, Google. It is about that guy that is going to establish the micro-businesses. So experiential learning is also very important. Learning inside the companies, ladies and gentlemen, creating national internship councils. So we want companies to have internships at all times so that people that are studying go and learn. Go and learn. Five minutes. I'll move very quickly. So we are, as private companies, the place where entrepreneurs are born. We either teach, teach them to our employees or uh, create internship jobs, uh, internships for these uh, uh, kids uh, that, that, uh, that have jobs. Germany has an incredible internship program, as, as you might know. You will not graduate from school unless you go through an internship program, 50 to 70% of the, imp uh, the apprentices spend their time in companies and not in formal education. Access to capital, everybody talks about it, but I have one thing to tell you about access to capital. I don't know to explain it to you. Let me talk about the microfinance industry because nobody talks about the microfinance industry, ladies and gentlemen, because it's about micro entrepreneurship and it's not very sexy. But the most important entrepreneur on earth is the creator of the microfinance industry. Let me give you a couple of Statistics about the Arab world which you've never heard of. Do you know how many loans have, have been disseminated in the Arab world from microfinance that is not given by banks? These are MFIs. MFIs are private or private public partnerships or NGOs. They don't take collateral. Microfinance, the idea of microfinance is you can't collateralize. You can't collateralize, so you give money to the people that cannot have access to money. 304 million beneficiaries in the Arab world, ladies and gentlemen. 1.9 billion dollars have been given. You think a single bank thinks of these people as worthy of getting a loan? 98% payback. 98% And much more importantly than that, for those of you that think women are not entrepreneurs, 85% of these people are women. 85% of these people are women. And let me talk to you about small Jordan in an MFI since I'm Jordanian and I always need to invoke my homeland. 250,000 borrowers exist in Jordan. 130 million dollars, I'll bet you not a single Jordanian here knows that. 
130 million dollars of active portfolio for six MFIs in Jordan. 250,000 people benefit from them. 90% are women and they all pay back. And the industry employs, these MFIs employ 2,000 people. So they are uh, entrepreneurial endeavors in themselves. Some of them are public-private partnerships. Some of them are for-profit and some of them are not for-profit and they are businesses in and by themselves. So, and then number three is what we also heard earlier. You need access to knowledge, our knowledge as entrepreneurs, our knowledge as business, as private sector, and our access to our wisdom. What does access to wisdom is mean? It means wherever we know how to access certain markets, we need to open that door to an entrepreneur who knocks on our door. There is a process for it. You need to actually say you want to do that for them. And then access to networks, our own networks. We are the most networked people on earth. I spend my time with the entrepreneurs I invest in, and I invest in a heck of a lot of entrepreneurs, introducing them to my friends, to my people. He says, yeah, I want to do business in Saudi Arabia. I'll tell him, I'll introduce you to this guy. He says, I want to do this. I'll introduce, introduce people to your network. Open it up. It is so difficult for a 25-year-old to have networks, but it is so easy for him if, he, if you hold his hand. Five. Build national information about the state of entrepreneurship in each city. We are going to name and shame, meaning we're going to rank cities in the Arab world. This is about cities, not about countries. Cities in the Arab world, what sort of entrepreneurship they have, what impediments they have, and we are going to list on a yearly basis the state of entrepreneurship in the Arab world by city and where the bottlenecks are. Six, advocacy. Yesterday, yesterday, 18 of the most online and, and powerful companies in the online and offline business in the UAE signed an MOU to enable e-business in the UAE and the Arab world. The Googles of this world, Facebook, Aramex, uh, 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 Booz and uh, Company, all sorts of other companies, Souq.com, local companies, 18 of us were able in a year to come together, agree on a platform to make sure that we enable e-businesses so that the startups of the world, not only the big companies, can actually conduct e-business. So advocacy is so important. And this was a private sector initiative that was adopted by the UAE government and said, yes, yes, let's do it. So advocacy is so essential, not only in that manner. We need to make sure that there is an Arab free trade agreement, ladies and gentlemen. You talk about startups scaling up without markets, we're not going to scale up. Why are we scared of Arab products to sell to each other? Why? Why do we need to, for the World Trade Organization to open our markets and we don't open it up to ourselves? Why do we have problems in getting visas and access to, uh, to each market? Entrepreneurs need to have visas. There should be a national initiative that says, entrepreneur visa. Any entrepreneur gets a visa. Free movement of goods, free movement, I mean. And then we have to uh, go to the media. Uh, Jeff, talk, I, I need two minutes. Media, celebrating success stories, role models, it's so essential. Our media is so socialist in their thinking. They think being in the capitalist world is nasty, is corrupt, and everybody is corrupt, ladies and gentlemen. This trickles down to the people in schools. They think it is bad to be in, in, in the private sector because the private sector is corrupt. And that's the big role of the media, wherever they are. How, when was the last time that you read a headline about a startup in the Arab world doing it? When Maktoub was bought by Yahoo, some of the leading media companies in the Arab world did not even know that the story existed. And that was $170 million, the first online knowledge, new industry acquisition in the Arab world. Nobody, nobody. I had to alert one of the major media companies. Here, there's a story, there's a press conference happening. Two more. We talked about uh, entrepreneurship. We're talking about intrapreneurship inside the organization. You know about that. And then we need to have love for these SMEs. Buy from them. Private sector needs to buy small. If you find a good company that has great products that is small and the startup, buy from it. Last but not least, and I'm, I'm cutting a couple of points. I know I always talk too much. If you go to the WAMDA website today, there is a page that says corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. If that interests you, sign up. We are going to have programs for you 
to make sure that this effort moves from talk to action on a cellular basis by country. Thank you very much.